Hi. In today's video, I want to show you how to model a gear rack. Now, this process is actually quite unusual because it doesn't involve any generators. We're just going to sketch it manually. And because it doesn't involve any generators, we can make this model parametric. So the first thing I'll do is go under Modify and Change Parameters. The first parameter I'll define is the module, which is going to be 2 millimeters. The proper unit for module is millimeters. Next, the pressure angle. That's going to be an angle, of course. Let's make that 20 degrees. Next, the number of teeth. That's going to be a unitless number. Let's just make that 30. The next thing I want to do is define the length overall. That's going to be in millimeters, of course. And that's going to be pi in full caps times the module times uh, the number of teeth. And the next thing is the back thickness at 5 millimeters. And I'll also define the width of this rack to be 20 millimeters. So that's all our parameters defined. And now we can get the sketching. So now I'll hit create sketch and I'll start a sketch on one of these vertical planes. And for this sketch, we're basically recreating a drawing from KHK gears that I've linked down below. So I'll start with R for rectangle to make a base which supports everything. And I'll make that base um, the back thickness tall. And the width is going to be the length overall of the rack. Next, I'm going to hit X for construction and L for line. And draw out two horizontal lines here. This horizontal line is going to be 1.25 times the module above the base of the rack. And the other horizontal line is going to be one time the module above the center line. So this line right here is the pitch line, which is analogous to the pitch circle that we've seen before. Now, just to ensure that everything is fully constrained, I'm going to constrain the endpoints of the lines to be coincident with the start of the rack. And I'm going to make the lengths equal to the length of the rack. This is just to ensure that everything is fully constrained and nothing is floating around strangely. Next, I'll disable construction and I'll hit L for line. And I'll draw three lines here. That'll actually make the gear tooth. I'm going to select the two flanks of the tooth and make sure those have equal length. I'm going to define this angle here to be 90 minus the pressure angle. And then the final thing I'll do is go under create point and add two points here where the tooth intersects the pitch line. And then what I can do is define the distance between these two points D for dimension as pi times the module divided by two. So the thickness of the tooth measured at the pitch line is pi times the module divided by two. So now everything is nearly completely constrained. The only thing I can do now is slide this tooth around like this. So the last thing I'll do is create a point here at the center of the tooth. So I just use the auto midpoint constraint there. And I'll define the distance here to be likewise pi times the module divided by 2. I'll then finish the sketch and I'll hit E for extrude and I'm going to extrude this in two parts for a reason I'll get into in just a second. So the thickness here is going to be the width and then Fusion 360 automatically hides the sketch in my settings anyway. So I unhide the sketch and I extrude this bit also to the width. Now, the KHK gear drawing shows a fillet at the root, and I want that fillet as well. Um, but I find that using fillets inside of the sketch environment is a little bit annoying because it tends to mess up your constraints a little bit. So I find it easier to do it like this. 
and then come in with the fillet tool after the fact to add the root fillets. So these are going to be 0 0.38 times the module. And that's one tooth completely done. Of course, we need a lot more than just one tooth. So next, I'm going under Create, Pattern, Rectangular Pattern. And under the Pattern type, I'm going to select Features. And you can select the features on the timeline here. So I'm going to pattern the fillet and the extrude for the tooth. And that is also why I extruded the base and the tooth separately, because now I can select just the tooth for this pattern. The direction is going to be this way. And this is apparently the negative direction for Fusion 360. That's fine. Um, under distance type, we're going for spacing. The quantity is going to be the number of teeth. And the distance, apparently negative again, is going to be minus pi times the module. And click OK on that. We've only used one of the two directions of a rectangular pattern, but that's totally fine. And that is a completed gear rack. The big advantage to using parameters like this is that you can now easily change the rack according to your needs. For example, do you need a rack with a module of three? Done. Do you perhaps want a pressure angle of 14 and a half? Done. Do you perhaps want a rack with 50 teeth? Done. So it takes a little bit of extra time to set up at the start, but once it's set up like this, it's really, really nice to have. Because this file may be interesting to you in itself, I've left it in the description below. Now what we've modeled so far is a perfect gear rack, but as we've seen in video two, we need to add some backlash to account for possible inaccuracies during manufacturing. So I'll go back into the parameters and I'll add a parameter which I'll call backlash. And for now, let's just set that to 0 0.1 millimeters. And I'll go back into the sketch that I have here. And I'm going to this width over here, the width of the tooth at the pitch line. And I'm going to have that be the same formula that it always was, except I'm just going to subtract the backlash from it. And that makes the tooth ever so slightly narrower. Finish the sketch and everything recomputes. And now we have a gear rack, including a backlash parameter. Let's now take a look at how we can model a helical rack. For this, I have reset all of my parameters to the original values and I've set the backlash to zero millimeters. So I'm going to create a sketch and I'm going to go to the back of the rack. I'm going to hit L for line and just draw a line out here. I'm going to make the vertical distance of this line 20 millimeters. And I'll make the angle between the existing rack and this line 45 degrees. Finish the sketch. And then under Create Sweep, I can sweep this profile along this path. And I'll select a new body here under Operation, uh, just to make my life a little easier down the line. I click OK. And there we have, essentially, a helical rack. Now, the only thing that you might not like about this is that it is now triangular in shape, and the edges anyway. So you can just go on the back, create a sketch, L for line, draw these out perpendicular, like so. Finish the sketch, E for extrude, click both of these triangles, and just drag them back like this. Distance is all, and the operation is automatically cut. And then you have a helical rack that is square. In the previous video, I talked about the difference between the normal and the transverse module. And I'd like to take a closer look at that again. So I will unhide sketch number two, which is the line along which the sweep went. And then I'll select plane along a path and I'll put that on that line and I'll put it all the way against the end. I'm going to modify split body and I'm going to split the helical rack along that new plane that I just made. And then under bodies, I will hide the larger of the two bodies. And now I can compare the uh, tooth of the helical rack versus the tooth on the normal rack. 
And if I look at those two, I can see that they have the same height, kind of obviously, but the teeth on the helical rack appear to be narrower. So you could ask, is that even a valid tooth form? And it is, and to show you, I'm going to create a sketch on this helical rack. So I'm first going to create a construction line, and I'm going to put that construction line 1.25 times the module above the base, and this is still the transverse module, and that's just to recreate the pitch line that we started this video with. I'm again going to add two points where the pitch line intersects the tooth, and then I'm going to check what the width is of this tooth, and it is 2.221 millimeters. And the important thing here is that in the case of the standard rack here, that width was 3.142 millimeters. But what's important now is that 2.221 is equal to 3.142 times the cosine of the helix angle of 45 degrees. So all that we're seeing here is that the normal module is equal to the transverse module times the cosine of 45 degrees. So what's weird about this tooth is actually not that it is narrower, that's completely expected, but what's perhaps somewhat weird about it is that it's a lot taller than you might otherwise expect. Because if we add the other two lines that should demark the top and the bottom end of the tooth, then this line, for example, would be 1.25 times the module. But what module am I talking about here? Is that the transverse module or the normal module? Both answers are entirely correct, but if you want two gears to mesh with each other, then you will have to use the same answer for both gears. Usually, if you are modeling in a transverse system, you would use the transverse module, and if you're modeling in a normal system, you would use the normal module. I've now jumped into Cura because I want to give you one pointer on slicing these parts. It may seem natural to put the rack with the back to the build plate like this to ensure that you have maximum contact area so that the print doesn't come off. But if you do this, the teeth of the rack will actually have a stepped kind of shape because the layers are forming steps in and of themselves. And so to prevent that, what you have to do is actually turn the rack on its side like this. And now the curve of the tooth is accurately recreated. And in general, if you have curves that you want to accurately recreate and that have to be smooth, then you must ensure that those curves lie entirely in the XY plane. The next thing I'd like to show you is that what we have here is in fact a correct gear rack. And to do that, I'll show you how to join it up with a regular spur gear. So the first thing I'm going to do is edit the sketch that we started with and create another horizontal construction line. And again, I'm going to just constrain this line to be safe. And I'm going to put this line 20 millimeters above the pitch line. And the reason for that is because I'll be meshing the rack up with a gear with a pitch diameter of 40 millimeters. So finish the sketch and then we'll unhide the sketch. And to set up all the motions, uh, we need to have some components. So I'm going to create a component. I'm going to do that from bodies. And I'm going to select the only body that we have. And we have a new component over here. So let me call it rack. And to prevent this component from moving around, I'll right click it and select ground. So this component here is now unable to move. The next thing I'll do is create another new component, and I'll call that shaft. And then I'll activate the root component again. And then the final component will be the gear that we make using the gear script. So this is pressure angle 20 degrees and module of 2. It has to be, otherwise it doesn't mesh. 
and then the number of teeth is 20 millimeters so that we have a pitch diameter of 40 millimeters which corresponds to the line that we've made. I'm going to set a backlash of 0 millimeters just to show you what a theoretical perfect mesh would look like. And for the gear thickness, I'm going to set it equal to the width parameter that we set up, just to show you that this doesn't actually work. So if I now go into the parameters here, and I change the width, you will see that the rack will update, it will become wider, but the gear won't do anything. And so I'll just reverse that now so that we have matching widths. Um, so what I'm going to do now is model the shaft. So I'm just going to drag this gear out of the way. And I'm not able to do that with the rack here because the rack is grounded. I'm going to activate the shaft component, create a sketch, put that on this plane here. And I'm going to select capture position here, which ensures that the gear stays where it is. Going for eight millimeters, that's kind of arbitrary. That doesn't really matter. I'm going to make that the width just to make that look nice. I'm going to activate the root component again and let's set up some joints. So the first joint I'm going to set up is between this cylinder here, the center of the cylinder, and this line over here. Now I'm going to drag that to the end point of the line and I want to make sure that the circle is facing me like this. So not facing left right like this but facing me. And then under the motion, I want to have a sliding motion and it's not the z-axis, it's not the y-axis, so it has to be the x-axis. And click OK. And the next thing I'll do is create another joint between the gear now and the shaft. And under motion, I'm going to make that revolute not this, so it's the z-axis. And then under position, I will select flip to make sure that it's in the right place and click OK on that. And so the meshing is already good because of the way I set up all the numbers. And then I will hide this sketch here. We no longer need that, just to clean up the visuals a bit. And then the final thing I'll do is set up a motion link. So under assemble, motion link, and under the joints, I will just select the slider and the revolute. And now the question is, if this gear rotates, for example, 360 degrees, what distance should it travel? And that's going to be the module times the number of teeth, the pitch diameter. And then the circumference of a circle is the diameter times pi, and pi again in all caps. So this is in the wrong direction, so let's just click Reverse. What you can also do if you prefer is just add a minus sign to the beginning here and click enter. And then we have a motion link set up. So if I now drag this gear like this, you can see the teeth mesh. So let's zoom on this like so. And then you see that it is a very tight mesh because of course on the rack and the gear, we set up the backlash at zero. Um, but that is what you have to do if you want to check a modeling method uh, because in that case, if your modeling method is correct, then it should be a perfect mesh if the backlash is zero. So this works just fine and it looks quite beautiful, I must say. And that's basically all I have for you today. All of the theory from video two still applies and in the case of helical racks, all of the theory from video three still applies. So in today's video, I simply don't really have any theory to cover. The only thing I want to finish off with, just in case, is if you want to make a herringbone rack, you can take a helical rack and go to create mirror, and then mirror the body over this mirror plane, click OK, and then modify, combine, and join up these two. And then you'll have a herringbone rack. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you found that interesting and have a good night.